Exploration of Botany Bay and Surrounding Coast of Australia An excerpt from Captain Cook's journal, First Voyage Edited by Captain W. J. L. Wharton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Excerpt from Captain Cook's journal during his first voyage round the world Made in H. M. Bark and Dever 1768 to 71, a literal transcription of the original manuscript, with notes and introduction edited by Captain W. J. L. Wharton, R. N. F. R. S., Hydrographer of the Admiralty. Except taken from Chapter 8, Exploration of East Coast of Australia. April 1770, Thursday, 19th. In the PM had fresh gales at south southwest and cloudy squally weather with a large southerly sea at six took in the topsails and at one a m brought to and sounded but had no ground with one hundred and thirty fathoms of line at five set the topsails close reefed and six saw land footnote the southeast coast of australia and footnote extending from northeast to west distance five or six leagues having eighty fathoms fine sandy bottom we continued standing to the westward with the wind at south-south-west until eight, at which time we got topgallant yards across, made all sail, and bore away along shore north-east for the eastermost land we had in sight, being at this time in the latitude of 37 degrees 58 minutes south and longitude of 210 degrees 39 minutes west. The southernmost point of land we had in sight, which bore us from west a quarter south, I judged to lay in the latitude of 38 degrees 0 minutes south and in the longitude of 211 degrees 7 minutes west from the meridian of Greenwich. I have named it Point Hicks because Lieutenant Hicks was the first who discovered this land. To the southward of this point we could see no land and yet it was clear in that quarter and by our longitude compared with that of Tasman's the body of Van Diemen's land ought to have bore due south from us and from the soon falling of the sea after the wind abated I had reason to think it did, but as we did not see it, and finding the coast to trend north-east and south-west, or rather more to the westward, makes me doubtful whether they are one land or no. Footnote. Had not the gale on the day before forced Cook to run to the northward, he would have made the north end of the Forno group, and probably have discovered Bass Strait, which would have cleared up the doubt which he evidently felt as to whether Tasmania was an island or not. The fact was not positively known until Dr. Bass sailed through the strait in a whaleboat in 1797. Point Hicks was merely a rise in the coastline, where it dipped below the horizon to the westward, and the name of Point Hicks Hill is now borne by an elevation that seems to agree with the position. End footnote. However, everyone who compares this journal with that of Tasman's will be as good a judge as I am, but it is necessary to observe that I do not take the situation of Van Diemen's from the printed charts, but from the extract of Tasman's journal, published by Dirk Rembrandt's. At noon we were in the latitude of 37 degrees 50 minutes and longitude of 210 degrees 29 minutes west. The extremes of the land, extending from northwest to east-northeast, a remarkable point, bore north 20 degrees east, distant four leagues. This point rises to a round hillock very much like the Ramhead going into Plymouth Sound, on which account I called it by the same name, latitude 37 degrees 39 minutes, longitude 210 degrees 22 minutes west. The variation by an azimuth taken this morning was 8 degrees 7 minutes east. What we have as yet seen of this land appears rather low and not very hilly, the face of the country green and woody, but the seashore is all a white sand. Friday 20th. In the PM and most part of the night had a fresh gale westerly with squalls, attended with showers of rain. In the AM had the wind at southwest with severe weather. At 1 PM saw three water spouts at once, two were between us and the shore, and one at some distance upon our larboard quarter. At 6 shortened sail, and brought two for the night, having 56 fathoms fine sandy bottom. The northernmost land in sight bore north by east half east in a small island footnote gabo island end footnote lying close to a point on the main bore west distant two leagues this point i have named cape howe footnote cape howe called after admirable earl howe is the southeast point of australia 
the position is almost exact. End footnote. It may be known by the trending of the coast, which is north on the one side and southwest on the other. Latitude 37 degrees 28 minutes south, longitude 210 degrees 3 minutes west. It may likewise be known by some round hills upon the main just within it. Having brought two with her head off shore, we at ten wore and lay her head in until four a.m., at which time we made sail along shore to the northward. At six, the northernmost land in sight bore north, being at this time about four leagues from the land. At noon we were in the latitude of 36 degrees 51 minutes south and longitude of 209 degrees 53 minutes west, and three leagues from the land. Course sailed along shore since yesterday at noon was first north 52 degrees east, 30 miles, then north by east and north by west, 41 miles. The weather being clear gave us an opportunity to view the country, which had a very agreeable and promising aspect, diversified with hills, ridges, plains and valleys, with some few small lawns, but for the most part the whole was covered with wood, the hills and ridges rise with a gentle slope, they are not high, neither are there many of them. Off Cape Dromedary, New South Wales, Saturday 21st, wind southerly, a gentle breeze and clear weather, with which we coasted along shore to the northward. In the p.m. we saw the smoke of fire in several places, a certain sign that the country is inhabited. At six, being about two or three leagues from the land, we shortened sail, and sounded and found forty-four fathoms a sandy bottom. Stood on under an easy sail until twelve o'clock, at which time we brought to until four a.m., when we made sail, having then forty fathoms five leagues from the land. At six we were abreast of a pretty high mountain laying near the shore, which on account of its figure I named Mount Dromedary, latitude thirty-six degrees eighteen minutes south, longitude 209 degrees 55 minutes west. The shore under the foot of the mountain forms a point, which I have named Cape Dromedary, over which is a peaked hillock. At this time found the variation to be 10 degrees 42 minutes east. Between 10 and 11 o'clock, Mr. Green and I took several observations of the sun and moon, the mean result of which gave 209 degrees 17 minutes west longitude from the meridian of Greenwich. By observation made yesterday, we were in the longitude 210 degrees 9 minutes. West 20 minutes gives 209 degrees 49 minutes, the longitude of the ship today at noon per yesterday's observation, the mean of which and today's give 209 degrees 33 minutes west, by which I fixed the longitude of this coast. Our latitude at noon was 35 degrees 49 minutes south. Cape Dromedary bore south 30 degrees west, distant 12 leagues. An open bay, footnote, Bateman Bay, End footnote, wherein lay three or four small islands, bore northwest by west, distant five or six leagues. This bay seemed to be but very little sheltered from the sea winds, and yet it is the only likely anchoring place I have yet seen upon the coast. Sunday 22nd In the p.m. had a gentle breeze at south by west, with which we steered along shore north by east and north-north-east, at the distance of about three leagues saw the smoke of fire in several places near the sea beach. At five we were abreast of a point of land, which, on account of its perpendicular cliffs, I called Point Upright, latitude 35 degrees, 35 minutes south. It bore from us due west, distant two leagues, and in this situation had thirty-one fathoms, sandy bottom. At six, falling little wind, we hauled off east-north-east, at this time the northernmost land in sight bore north by east half east, and at midnight being in seventy fathoms, we brought to until four a.m., at which time we made sail in for the land, and at daylight found ourselves nearly in the same place we were at five o'clock in the evening, by which it was apparent that we had been drove about three leagues to the southward by a tide or current in the night. After this we steered along shore north-north-east, having a gentle breeze at south-west, and were so near the shore as to distinguish several people upon the sea beach. They appeared to be of a very dark or black colour, but whether this was the real colour of their skins, or the clothes they might have on, I know not. At noon we were by observation in the latitude of 35 degrees 27 minutes and longitude 209 degrees 23 minutes. Cape Dromedary bore south 28 degrees west, distance 15 leagues. A remarkable peaked hill laying inland, the top of which looked like a pigeon-house, and occasioned my giving it that name, 
bore north 32 degrees 33 minutes west, and a small low island laying close under the shore bore northwest, distance two or three leagues. Variation of the compass nine degrees 50 minutes east. When we first discovered this island in the morning, I was in hopes from its appearance that we should have found shelter for the ship behind it. But when we came to approach it near, I did not think that there was even security for a boat to land. But this, I believe, I should have attempted, had not the wind come on shore, after which I did not think it safe to send a boat from the ship, as we had a large hollow sea from the south-east, rowling in upon the land, which beat everywhere very high upon the shore. And this we have had ever since we came upon the coast. The land near the sea coast still continues of a moderate height, forming alternately rocky points and sandy beaches. But inland between Mount Dromedary and the Pigeon House are several pretty high mountains, two only of which we saw but what were covered with trees, and these lay inland behind the Pigeon House, and are remarkably flat atop, with steep rocky cliffs all round them. As far as we could see the trees in this country hath all the appearance of being stout and lofty. For these two days past, the observed latitude hath been twelve or fourteen miles to the southward of the ship's account given by the log, which can be owing to nothing but a current set to the southward. Monday, 23rd. In the p.m. had a gentle breeze at east, which in the night veered to northeast and north. At half-past four p.m., being about five miles from the land, we tacked and stood off southeast and east until four a.m., at which time we tacked and stood in being then about nine or ten leagues from the land. At eight, it fell little wind, and soon after, calm. At noon, we were by observation in the latitude of thirty-five degrees, thirty-eight minutes, and about six leagues from the land, Mount Dromedary bearing south thirty-seven degrees west, distant seventeen leagues, and the Pigeon House north forty degrees west. In this situation, had seventy-four fathoms. Tuesday, 24th. In the p.m., had variable light airs and calms until six o'clock, at which time a breeze sprung up at north by west. At this time we had seventy fathoms water, being about four or five leagues from the land, the Pigeon House bearing north forty degrees west, Mount Dromedary south thirty degrees west, and the northernmost land in sight north nineteen degrees east. Stood to the northeast until noon, having a gentle breeze at northwest, at which time we tacked and stood to the westward being then by observation in the latitude of 35 degrees 10 minutes south and longitude 208 degrees 51 minutes west. A point of land which I named Cape St. George, we having discovered it on that saint's day, bore west, distant 19 miles, and the Pigeon House south 7 degrees west, the latitude and longitude of which I found to be 35 degrees 19 minutes south and 209 degrees 42 minutes west. In the morning we found the variation to be, by the amplitude, seven degrees fifty minutes east by several azimuths seven degrees fifty four minutes east three entries skipped saturday twenty eighth in the p m hoisted out the pinnace signor in order to attempt a landing but the pinnace took in the water so fast that she was obliged to be hoisted in again to stop her leaks at this time we saw several people ashore four of whom were carrying a small boat or canoe which we imagined they were going to put into the water in order to come off to us but in this we were mistaken. Being now not above two miles from the shore, Mr. Banks, Dr. Sullender, Tupia, and myself put off in the yawl and pulled in for the land to a place where we saw four or five of the natives, who took to the woods as we approached the shore, which disappointed us in the expectation we have of getting a near view of them, if not to speak to them. But our disappointment was heightened when we found that we nowhere could effect a landing by reason of the great surf which beat everywhere upon the shore. We saw hauled up upon the beach three or four small canoes, which to us appeared not much unlike the small ones of New Zealand. In the wood were several trees of the palm kind, and no underwood, and this was all we were able to observe from the boat, after which we returned to the ship about five in the evening. Footnote. The place where Cook attempted to land is near Bulli, a place where there is now considerable export of coal. A large coal port, Wollongong, lies a little to the southward. End footnote. At this time it fell calm, and we were not above a mile and a half from the shore, in eleven fathoms, and within some breakers that lay to the southward of us. But luckily a light breeze came off from the land which carried us out of danger, and with which we stood to the northward. 
At daylight in the morning we discovered a bay, footnote, Botany Bay, and footnote, which appeared to be tolerably well sheltered from all winds, into which I resolved to go with the ship, and with this view sent the master in the pinnace to sound the entrance, while we kept turning up with the ship, having the wind right out. At noon the entrance bore north-north-west, distance one mile. At Anchor, Botany Bay, New South Wales. Sunday 29th. In the p.m., wind southerly and clear weather, with which we stood into the bay and anchored under the south shore about two miles within the entrance in five fathoms, the south point bearing southeast and the north point east. Saw as we came in, on both points of the bay, several of the natives and a few huts, men, women and children, on the south shore abreast of the ship, to which place I went in the boats in hopes of speaking with them, accompanied by Mr. Banks, Dr. Sullender and Tupia. As we approached the shore, they all made off except two men, who seemed resolved to oppose our landing. As soon as I saw this, I ordered the boats to lay upon their oars in order to speak to them. But this was to little purpose, for neither us nor Tupia could understand one word they said. We then threw them some nails, beads, etc., ashore, which they took up and seemed not ill-pleased with, insomuch that I thought they beckoned us to come ashore, but in this we were mistaken, for as soon as we put the boat in, they again came to oppose us, upon which I fired a musket between the two, which had no other effect than to make them retire back, where bundles of their darts lay, and one of them took up a stone and threw at us, which caused my firing a second musket, loaded with small shot. And although some of the shot struck the man, yet it had no other effect than making him lay hold on a target. Immediately after this we landed, which we had no sooner done than they throwed two darts at us, this obliged me to fire a third shot, soon after which they both made off, but not in such haste but what we might have taken one, but, Mr. Banks being of opinion that the darts were poisoned, made me cautious how I advanced into the woods. We found here a few small huts made of the bark of trees, in one of which were four or five small children, with whom we left some strings of beads, etc. A quantity of darts lay about the huts. These we took away with us. Three canoes lay upon the beach, the worst I think I ever saw. They were about twelve or fourteen feet long, made of one piece of the bark of a tree, drawn or tied up at each end, and the middle kept open by means of pieces of stick by way of thwarts. After searching for fresh water without success, except a little in a small hole dug in the sand, we embarked and went over to the north point of the bay, where, in coming in, we saw several people, but when we landed now there was nobody to be seen. We found here some fresh water, which came trinkling down and stood in pools among the rocks. But as this was troublesome to come at, I sent a party of men ashore in the morning to the place where we first landed, to dig holes in the sand, by which means, and a small stream, they found fresh water sufficient to water the ship. The string of beads, etc., we had left with the children last night, were found laying in the huts this morning. Probably the natives were afraid to take them away. After breakfast we sent some empty casks ashore, and a party of men to cut wood, and I went myself in the pinnace to sound and explore the bay, in the doing of which I saw some of the natives, but they all fled at my approach. I landed in two places, one of which the people had but just left, as there were small fires and fresh mussels broiling upon them. Here, likewise, lay vast heaps of the largest oyster shells I ever saw. Monday 30th as soon as the wooders and waterers were come on board to dinner, ten or twelve of the natives came to the watering place, and took away their canoes that lay there, but did not offer to touch any one of our casks that had been left ashore, and in the afternoon, sixteen or eighteen of them came boldly up to within one hundred yards of our people at the watering place, and there made a stand. Mr. Hicks, who was the officer ashore, did all in his power to entice them to him by offering them presents, but it was to no purpose. All they seemed to want was for us to be gone. After staying a short time, they went away. They were all armed with darts and wooden swords. The darts have each four prongs and pointed with fish bones. Those we have seen seem to be intended more for striking fish than offensive weapons. Neither are they poisoned, as we at first thought. After I had returned from sounding the bay, I went over to a cove on the north side of the bay, where, in three or four halls with the scene, 
we caught about three hundred pounds weight of fish, which I caused to be equally divided among the ship's company. In the a.m. I went in the pinnace to sound and explore the north side of the bay, where I neither met with inhabitants or anything remarkable. Mr. Green took the sun's meridian altitude a little within the south entrance of the bay, which gave the latitude 34 degrees 0 minutes south. May 1770. Tuesday, May 1st. Gentle breezes northerly. In the p.m., ten of the natives again visited the watering place. I, being on board at this time, went immediately ashore, but before I got there they were going away. I followed them alone and unarmed some distance along shore, but they would not stop until they got farther off than I choose to trust myself. These were armed in the same manner as those that came yesterday. In the evening I sent some hands to haul the seine, but they caught very few fish. A little after sunrise I found the variation to be eleven degrees three minutes east. Last night, Forby Sutherland, seaman, departed this life, and in the a.m. his body was buried ashore at the watering place, which occasioned my calling the south point of this bay after his name. This morning a party of us went ashore to some huts not far from the watering place, where some of the natives are daily seen. Here we left several articles such as cloth, looking glasses, combs, beads, nails, etc. After this we made an excursion into the country, which we found diversified with woods, lawns, and marshes. The woods are free from underwood of every kind, and the trees are at such a distance from one another that the whole country, or at least great part of it, might be cultivated without being obliged to cut down a single tree. We found the soil everywhere except in the marshes to be a light white sand, and produceth a quantity of good grass which grows in little tufts about as big as one can hold in one's hand, and pretty close to one another. In this manner the surface of the ground is quoted. In the woods between the trees, Dr. Solander had a bare sight of a small animal, something like a rabbit, and we found the dung of an animal, footnote, this was the kangaroo, end footnote, which must feed upon grass, and which, we judge, could not be less than a deer. We also saw the track of a dog or some such like animal. We met with some huts and places where the natives had been, and at our first setting out one of them was seen, the others, I suppose, had fled upon our approach. I saw some trees that had been cut down by the natives with some sort of a blunt instrument, and several trees that were barked, the bark of which had been cut by the same instrument, in many of the trees, especially the palms, were cut steps of about three or four feet asunder for the conveniency of climbing them. We found two sorts of gum, one sort of which is like gum dragon, and is the same, I suppose, Tasman took for gum lac. It is extracted from the largest tree in the woods. Wednesday 2nd Between 3 and 4 in the p.m. we returned out of the country, and after dinner went ashore to the watering place, where we had not been long before 17 or 18 of the natives appeared in sight. In the morning I had set Mr. Gore with a boat up to the head of the bay to judge for oysters. In his return to the ship, he and another person came by land, and met with these people, who followed him at the distance of ten or twenty yards. Whenever Mr. Gore made a stand and faced them, they stood also, and notwithstanding they were all armed, they never offered to attack him. But after he had parted from them, and they were met by Dr. Monkhouse and one or two more, who upon making a sham retreat, they throwed three darts after him, after which they began to retire. Dr. Solander, I, and Tupia made all the haste we could after them, but could not, either by words or actions, prevail upon them to come near us. Mr. Gore saw some up the bay, who by signs invited him ashore, which he prudently declined. In the a.m. had the wind in the southeast with rain, which prevented me from making an excursion up the head of the bay as I intended. Thursday 3rd. Winds at southeast, a gentle breeze and fair weather. In the p.m. I made a little excursion along the sea coast to the southward, accompanied by Mr. Banks and Dr. Solander. At our first entering the woods we saw three of the natives, who made off as soon as they saw us. More of them were seen by others of our people, who likewise made off as soon as they found they were discovered. In the a.m. I went in the pinnace to the head of the bay, accompanied by Doctors Solander and Monkhouse, in order to examine the country and to try to form some connections with the natives. 
In our way thither we met with ten or twelve of them fishing, each in a small canoe, who retired into shoal water upon our approach. Others again we saw at the first place we landed at, who took to their canoes and fled before we came near them. After this we took water, and went almost to the head of the inlet, where we landed and travelled some distance inland. We found the face of the country much the same as I have before described, but the land much richer, for instead of sand I found in many places a deep black soil, which we thought was capable of producing any kind of grain. At present it produceth, besides timber, as fine meadow as ever was seen. However, we found it not all like this. Some few places were very rocky, but this I believe to be uncommon. The stone is sandy and very proper for building, etc. After we had sufficiently examined this part, we returned to the boat, and seeing some smoke in canoes at another part, we went thither in hopes of meeting with the people, but they made off as we approached. There were six canoes and six small fires near the shore, and mussels roasting upon them, and a few oysters laying near. From this we conjectured that there had been just six people, who had been out each in his canoe, picking up the shellfish, and come ashore to eat them, where each had made his fire to dress them by. We tasted of their cheer, and left them in return strings of beads, etc. The day being now far spent, we set out on our return to the ship. Friday 4th. Winds northerly, serene weather. Upon my return to the ship in the evening, I found that none of the natives had appeared near the watering place, but about twenty of them had been fishing in their canoes at no great distance from us. In the a.m., as the wind would not permit us to sail, I sent out some parties into the country to try to form some connections with the natives. One of the midshipmen met with a very old man, and woman and two small children. They were close to the waterside, where several more were in their canoes gathering of shellfish, and he, being alone, was afraid to make any stay with the two old people, lest he should be discovered by those in the canoes. He gave them a bird he had shot, which they would not touch, neither did they speak one word, but seemed to be much frightened. They were quite naked, even the woman had nothing to cover her nudities. Dr. Monkhouse and another man being in the woods, not far from the watering place, discovered six more of the natives, who at first seemed to wait his coming, but as he was going up to them he had a dart thrown at him out of a tree, which narrowly escaped him. As soon as the fellow had thrown the dart, he descended the tree and made off, and with him all the rest, and these were all that were met with in the course of this day. End of Excerpts from Captain Cook's Journal Exploration of Botany Bay and Surrounding Coast of Australia